from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy McGuigan. I am from the Library of Congress, and I want to welcome you to our last session of our first online conference. Um, and we have a great presentation for you this evening. This session is called Making Thinking Visible with Primary Sources. And the session will model how to use visible thinking strategies to enhance the power of primary sources in your classroom. A wide variety of easy-to-use routines will be introduced. Two educators will provide examples of how they've used these routines with primary sources to help their students learn to think, to think and to think to learn. So we have three presenters with us this evening. First off, we have Ann Savage. She's an educational resource specialist at the Library of Congress, where she specializes in developing and delivering professional development content and materials for educators. She's a proponent of Project Zero's visible thinking and has integrated thinking strategies into many of the library's primary source-based PD offerings. We also have with us Christina Palmer. She is the library director at St. Stephen's Episcopal School in Bradenton, Florida. She's active in the Association for Independent School Librarians and formerly worked as a poet in the schools of Wa in Washington. She believes that libraries are crucial to teaching students to deal with information overload and uses visible thinking strategies to help students reflect, particularly as they develop strategies to become competent and confident 21st century researchers. Also joining us this morning for him, this evening for us, is Cameron Patterson. He's the head of learning and teaching responsible for the strategic le leadership of learning and teaching innovation, and promoting excellence in teaching practice at the Shore School in Sydney, Australia. He also leads a study group at Harvard's annual Project Zero classroom. He holds four master's degrees. He has received several awards for leadership in teaching, and he was a top 50 nominee for the Global Teaching Prize in 2015. I want to thank all three of our presenters for joining us. I want to thank you folks for joining the audience, the participants. We look forward to a lively conversation. And I run things over to Ann Savage. Hi, this is Ann at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. And I am really excited to have our two special guests here tonight to share with us these two topics. These topics, visible thinking and primary sources, are dear to my heart because they both empower students to think for themselves and to have a valued voice in the classroom. What we're going to do first is find out a little bit about you. We have a poll. And Kathy, can you bring that up? Just to find out a little bit about your experience with, uh, primary, with uh, making thinking visible. Chrissy, you should see a poll up on the screen. And click in one of the radio buttons. OK. I think we have almost everyone. And it's great to see we have a lot of diversity, including a lot of people who are interested in learning more. Terrific. Thank you, Kathy. And then secondly, um, Let's practice using the chat window for those of you that haven't tried yet. Just share with us briefly what you teach, what subject and grade, and then what state or country you are from. Terrific. We have folks from all over the country, Venezuela, 
Terrific. Thanks, everybody. While you're uh, introducing yourselves, I'm going to share our objectives. First, I'm going to start things off by modeling with you a primary source analysis using some visible thinking routines. Then we're going to uh, hear examples of classroom practice from Christina and Cameron. And Cameron is going to finish out for the last half of the session by giving us background about Project Zero and visible thinking resources. So we're going to start, instead of me talking to you about what visible thinking and primary sources are, we're just going to immerse ourselves for a few minutes right now. So give yourself about 15 seconds to look at this primary source. And then share in the chat box, what do you notice first? And what we are doing right now in these few minutes is an analysis routine we call at the library, observe, reflect, and question. Wally, what makes you say that the voter is determined or worried? And Brianna, what makes you think that there is a reversal of traditional roles? What do you see that makes you think that? OK, thank you. Keep on sharing. Thank you, Sarah. We're going to go through this exercise very quickly so that we have plenty of time later to hear from our educators from the field. So let's move on to the next question. Now this is reflecting. And I'm going to offer a couple prompts to help you reflect. What, who do you think was the audience for this cartoon? Ah, lots of varied answers. I'd say split pretty evenly amongst men and women. Newspaper readers, thank you. All right, um, obviously you would spend a lot of time on this if you were doing this with your students. But here's another prompt to help you reflect. And that's, what do you think the cartoonist's opinion on this issue is? Aha, against women voting. Women should not vote. Interesting. OK, we're going to move on. Thanks, everyone. And lastly, if we were in the classroom and had more time, we would ask students what you wonder about. Um, you'll notice that, as with the other things in this slideshow, we have uh, live links to the resources. Uh, right now, instead of continuing with this activity, we're going to ask you to look at a little uh, a two, two and a half minute video about the next visible thinking routine we might use with this particular primary source. So I'm going to give you two minutes and 40 seconds. Go ahead and click on this and watch the movie. We'll be back with you soon.
Okay, now let's move on to the part that we've all been waiting for, finding out what visible thinking with primary sources look like in the classroom. We're going to go to Florida now and hear from Christina. <laughs> um, I was so excited to be asked to talk with you today about some visible thinking routines that I've used in the library and in the classroom. And I was thrilled to see how many librarians are attending because one of the things that I love best about being a librarian is being able to see the students' thought processes develop and mature over a period of years. I work with middle and high schoolers, so I get to see them for six years as their thoughts advance and they become more comfortable with themselves and their own thoughts. Today, I'm specifically going to talk about information literacy and how it can be layered onto lessons in any subject and how many of the same routines can be used at both the middle and the high school level. For me, I found that once students are comfortable with the routines and the vocabulary of specific tasks, they're a lot quicker to jump to the next step, which is the harder work of actually relating to the material and thinking more deeply. And the Library of Congress has been instrumental to my teaching because they've done such a good job of collecting and sharing resources on a variety of subjects. And everything's carefully labeled, so it's pretty quick work to figure out what's useful for your specific needs. I'm going to highlight two of their resource collections before describing some specific activities that I've completed in the classroom in conjunction with our history, humanities, and English teachers. Um, immigration's been in the news pretty much daily over the past few months um, from international migration on a massive scale in the Middle East um, to political candidates' comments closer to home in the U.S. And I found that a lot of my students only have a cursory interest in the political news, and current events can sometimes get bypassed in the day-to-day -day curriculum. In my case, as a school, we've been looking at patterns of immigration historically and also in the present day. And this teacher's guide, and again, you can find the link below, describes immigration controversies in America from the 1790s through the 1900s. Um, it is, offers a well-written background, um, but more importantly, it has a lot of um, additional sources and lesson plans. So you're able to decide if your students would be best served by examining items like newspapers, or if songs would work better, or photographs, or maps, or charts. Um, and I like that they don't do your work for you, but they provide a curated arsenal of resources that makes it easier for you to figure out what works for your students. And the next resource I have, um, how many people have used the student discovery sets? I don't know if anyone has, or if you're a one-to-one -one school, I highly recommend them. We're a one-to-one -one iPad school, and you can also download the sets to other mobile devices um, in iTunes. Again, this is the immigration set, but others range from children's life in the early 20th century, US symbols, understanding the cosmos, if there are any science teachers here. And what's great about these sets is that the students get individual primary sources, um, or their digital reproductions, into their hands for individual analysis. It's easy for them to zoom in to better see detail. There's an annotation feature. And the primary source analysis tool that Anne had mentioned is available within each page. Um, I highly recommend that tool because it starts off with some basic prompts, like what do you notice first that anyone can answer. And it works towards questions like, who do you think the audience was for this image? Or what do you think happened a minute later? So I really have found that that's helpful for almost sneaking the kids in towards a higher level of thought. I've noticed um, that my students are more comfortable expressing their thoughts on images than on other media like maps or text. There's an immediacy to images, particularly ones that feature people. They can't help but try to imagine the scene more fully and to try to make up the questions surrounding the lives of the individuals. When I work with students, I'm pretty explicit with them that my goal is to consider our patterns of thought, not to come to a particular conclusion. And with an issue like immigration, something that is so politicized, we're never going to convince every one of our viewpoints but I don't want that to stop us from having a civil discussion or trying to have a civil discussion. 
So two of the reasons that I have mentioned um, print newspapers here are because of issues of prioritization and filter bubbling. I do show the kids the digital edition, and I narrate my thought process, because I think it's an important part of information literacy. The lesson planning shouldn't really be a black box to them. For those of you who aren't librarians, if you don't know the word filter bubble, it's the idea that the internet is distinctive for each of us based on our past experiences and searches. So the news stories that pop to the top of my screen when I log onto the internet, and even the ads on the side, are different than the ones that appear for you. Basically, it means the internet looks vastly different, depending on whether you spend most of your time on NPR or on Fox News or maybe on TMZ. Um, so not just the stories that they cover, but also how they're covered and what it's suggested that you might like. So there's the ideal that people can use the internet to explore alternate viewpoints, but most people actually use it to confirm their own. But print newspapers can't do that. There's one front page that needs to draw on the attention of everyone. And so there's a different value on prioritization when there's one shot at the story that wants to generate the highest number of people getting them to engage with the paper. And so with that, nothing's left to chance from the type of story covered to the artistic components of the image. So is it black or white, or is it in color? Is it candid, or is it posed? Does it feature close-ups or a large vista? Um, students will think how often this comes into play in their own lives. And if you want to get a response to this, you can ask them about the images on their phones and whether they have trouble deleting multiple images that are almost identical. We have kids that have, like, absolutely full phones because they can't decide anything to delete, and they don't see the value of choosing one thing over something else. So um, I found that this is really helpful in getting them to slow down, think about priorities. I actually do five minutes per image just to give it time almost, um, I hate using the word boring, but it gives them a downswing before there's an upswing, um, and they notice a lot of the details that weren't apparent at first glance. Cameron, I am looking forward to checking out that TED link when I am done with this session. Um, so this is a specific image from the New York Times on September 10th, and it immediately caught my eye because of the expression on the boy's face. So take a minute, look at it, feel free to share your thoughts in a chat box. Uh, one of the visible thinking strategies that I use is called See, Think, Wonder. Um, there are a lot of similar strategies out there. Students first answer the question, what do I see? And everyone can answer that question for every image, regardless of whether they have um, any experience with the topic or not. The next question is, what do I think? And that gives the student a chance um, to connect their own understanding of a topic using their prior knowledge, as well as any emotional or visceral responses that they have to it. And this tends to lead directly to the final question, what do I wonder? What context questions do we have? Especially at the beginning of a unit, uh, this makes the human connections and it ignites their curiosity. It also pre-assumes that they have an interest in a subject and immediately places the teens in direct relation to it. A follow-up activity that I do with this is to have students write their own headlines some students, or some teachers, not students, some teachers provide only the image, but I leave the caption there for students who are searching for a bit more detail. And that task gets them thinking about the value of headlines and grabbing attention. And also, again, there's a direct relevance to their own lives, because they have to think about what they choose to engage with in the quote-unquote headlines that they encounter every day. And that might mean questioning the links that they follow on Twitter or why certain Instagram photos join the so-called 100 likes club. For them, we have not yet reached a saturation point with media consumption, especially as many of them carry media with them 24 hours a day. So I'm looking at some of your responses here. Um, and again, I'm using immigration specifically because that's something that's been in my mind and in my classrooms a lot over the past few months. Um, but these activities and these um, routines could take place on most um, social issues. So some of the student answers that they provided um, are included here. 
I'm going to tell you first that I love the way that the students talked about the background of this image that's now covered up. Um, immediately, almost all of the students talk about the image taking place in either a store or a closet. And the second that one student says closet, there's another one who will tell them that, that doesn't make any sense. And for the students who do have access to this caption that indicates it's an aid distribution site, they get there on their own through a series of deductions. Stores don't hang all of their jeans together. Shouldn't stores have more than one of each kind of jacket? Um, the clothing's all different sizes. It must be cold, because it looks like winter clothing. And the next thing you know, the students are wondering if the boy has any other jackets, um, and they're Googling the winter temperatures in Munich. So I have to say that even though I followed some of the research showing that students are less confident today um, in reading facial expressions, it's been surprising for me to see that in action. Almost all of you, there are a lot of comments about the um, expression on his face, um, the expressions, the human side of this. And for our kids, um, I have found that some of them are just hesitant to try to talk about that. And I think that that shows how important it is that we provide a safe space for students to practice that empathy with the wider world. And no class yet has agreed about the expression, but in all of them, we've had a variety of viewpoints and valuable discussions around that. For students, even if they didn't find the image immediately interesting, one of them said, oh, I don't want to look at the clothing. Um, we're story-making animals. So like, we can't help but want to know the before and the after and to storify what we see. And it can be really hard, because there's so much that I want to share. But I find that when I talk less and I listen more, I'm incredibly impressed with the quality of the conversation um, that we have. And really, it's like almost in a way, it means so much more when it comes from them, and I'm not the one that's directing it. Also, I'm not sure that I am creative enough to come up with the fake headlines like they did. Um, my favorite being local teen turns life around in a zip. Uh, but Germany welcomes immigrants with open arms is a like, close second there. Um, and I think that they show a playfulness with language and an understanding of the form that's important far beyond the specific issue. So to finish up, um, the way that this lesson developed uh, involved a discussion about the merits of print and digital news. And there's distinctions between them, so not necessarily that one is better followed by a class see, think, wonder of a specific news image. Then the students individually wrote headlines and shared them. Teams of students then compared their images and completed see, think, wonder in their small groups, creating an intention getting headline together. They joined with other groups for a discussion from the perspective of the publisher of the paper. So what are the different purposes for these two or three images? Why is this particularly a story worth sharing? How does the artistic composition of the shot add to the meaning? What do you want to know now? And the results differ from class to class. And for me, that's been fine. I think that when students are engaging with the world around them and the world in which they live and learning to defend their own ideas, that that's a really worthwhile goal in education. Uh, please feel free to ask me questions during the later q and I see that some of them are coming up, or to get in touch with me electronically at any point. I'm happy to share any of my materials and offer ideas about getting students to reflect on their learning and their interactions with the world. Thank you so much. And thank you, Christina, for this powerful sharing that you've done and also for your offer to share from in the future. Um, we're now going to move around the globe to Sydney, Australia. And we'll hear from Cameron Patterson next. Uh, really pleased to be sharing some of my fledgling experiences with thinking routines with you. Uh, I'm intending to run through a couple of examples quite quickly and then more specifically talk about some ideas around the purpose and impact of using thinking routines. So to begin with, this is a photograph from the Library of Congress that I use with my students. I'm a history teacher. I get my students to do the See, Think, Wonder routine with this photograph, which is very similar to the observe, reflect, question routine that Anne demonstrated at the beginning of this session. And I think that just makes the point that thinking routines, uh, I can see you want me to move a little bit away from the mic, got that Anne, thanks. 
Uh, just making the point that thinking routines are adaptable and we can adapt them according to our purposes as teachers and that's what I really love about them. They're not set in stone. With this particular photograph, uh, given that my students are Australian, the context is quite unusual for them. And one of the things I love using photographs for, and I was taught very early on, is to try and get through across to my students a variety of perspectives. So I always try and select a photograph or an image which has several people looking in different directions. I think it allows the students to engage with those different perspectives more effectively. And another thing that I learnt early on was the importance of trying to select photographs with people in the photographs who are almost similar in age to the students. So the students have the ability to connect with their perspective a little bit more effectively. When I run through the see think routine with my students in this photo, using this photograph, they always identify very quickly that the photograph is related to civil rights, that it's a, a photograph from the US, but they struggle beyond that, particularly when I use it to initiate a new unit or a new topic. When they look at the photograph, invariably students will tell me that they think that the mothers are protecting the children, and they get confused by the fact that the students are smiling and happy. And I'm actually pretty comfortable for my students to be confused. I think that's where their real understanding begins to develop. As I said, this photograph is from the Library of Congress collection. And when I share the information about it with my students, they immediately become very keen to know how organised the protest had been. And I find this is a really useful starting point for any sort of discussion about US civil rights. And I think it's important to actually leave my students with more questions than they begin with. Uh, I think that's a really vital part of teaching with thinking routines, is that I'm trying to get my students to raise questions and ask questions, and sometimes it's OK for us not to answer all of the questions immediately. We can leave them hanging. I also use, in some of my teaching, uh, we've just been doing some work on popular culture with a grade 9 class, and so I use resources from uh, Splash ABC and here in Australia. And this is a photograph that I use for popular culture. And I recently used what we call a thinking, a thinking routine called Step Inside, which actually works really nicely hand in hand with the circle of viewpoints routine that uh, Anne mentioned and was modelled in the YouTube clip earlier in the session. And the purpose of a Step Inside routine, and here it is, is to really step inside someone else's shoes to try and deepen students' understanding. So trying to put themselves in that situation to see things from one of those other person's point of view in that photograph. So we work through the routine. What can the person see? What might the person believe? What might the person care deeply about? And what might the person wonder about? And some of the responses from students are fascinating. We're getting uh, what they can see here in the top slide. So it's very much noticing and describing exactly what's in the photograph. Uh, we're getting underneath some of the points about what might they believe or what might they care deeply about. And I really want to emphasise the importance of that word might in the thinking routine, because might implies conditional language, which then opens the way for our students to hypothesise and raise possibilities and lead to more insightful thinking. What I really enjoyed about using this particular routine with my students was they were wondering about things like, will there be any more nuclear war? What will be the next step in technology? How will I get home? Which I thought was quite hilarious when you think about the people in that photograph. Who's going to win the space race? When will colour TV come into the mainstream? So they're the sorts of things that students are coming up with. And at the end of a routine, I'll often ask students to produce some sort of a written reflection to try and draw, th try and draw things together. I really like the final one here of the people in that photograph. They probably don't know how much they had, of he they had ahead of them. That's coming from a 14-year-old student, which I think is quite insightful. We want our students to become proficient with the kinds of thinking that they can use to develop their own understanding. This is an understanding map, which is a really good place to start of the different sorts of thinking routines. This is sort of a basis for the routines that can be used. If we want more information, uh, the two best books that I think every teacher should be reading are Making Thinking Visible and, more recently, this year, Ron Richart 
has released Creating Cultures of Thinking, which is more the philosophy behind it. So Making Thinking Visible is an approach to developing students' thinking dispositions. It actually runs through a whole range of routines, whereas Creating Cultures of Thinking is more about the cultural forces that really make a difference to learning. And thinking routines are just one of the cultures that affect the thinking and learning in our classrooms. Other resources. We've got the Project Zero Visible Thinking website, which is constantly being added to. Uh, there's some fantastic routines now coming from Agency by Design, uh, which is a useful website to look at as well. Ron Richart has his own Cultures of Thinking website with Cultures of Thinking resources. If you can ever muster the finances, I would highly, highly recommend attending the Project Zero classroom, which is held at Harvard, Cambridge, in the end of July for five days every week. It's the most inspiring learning experience you can possibly take part in. Uh, Twitter chats are great. There's a couple of hashtags there that you can take part in, and one of my own blog posts about helping students become better thinkers. So just some points now about the ideas around and the purpose and impact of using, utilising thinking routines in class. One of the key principles of the cultures of thinking work and the use of thinking routines is that think learning is a consequence of thinking. Because most of our thinking is invisible, it can be really hard for students to know how to think well and improve their thinking, and particularly difficult for, for teachers to know how to help students become better thinkers. And this is where thinking routines play such a key role. As teachers, we're usually pretty good at behaviour management routines. We do that at the first lesson of class. And Ron Richard often asks what it would look like if instead of emphasising behaviour early on in the year, we emphasise thinking. And instead of routine, routinising our management, which of course we need to do, we spent more time actually putting routines around thinking, which is the whole purpose of what it is we're talking about. So in a classroom with a culture of visible thinking, students get these opportunities to articulate their ideas. They think things through for themselves. They're not just being told what to think. So their awareness of their thinking strategies increases. When students are encouraged to ask questions and consider what they already know, and probe their own ideas and really look for key relationships, it deepens their learning and develops their thinking dispositions. The whole idea of making thinking visible is to make what is really tangled and in inter interconnecting relationships apparent so that students are forming authentic knowledge instead of just remembering disparate facts. I think the role of the teacher is important here. and it's, it's impossible for students to think without something to think about. And I think that's where the Library of Congress plays such an important role with the wonderful resources, primary sources they provide for teachers. Teachers often seem to feel that our role is to simplify subject matter for learners, but as I've already indicated, I think sometimes we need to allow our students to feel confused. So it's through the complexities of the photographs and the images that we've been showing in this session so far that learners really gain access to the subject matter. And that's why teacher content expertise is so crucial in knowing which images or primary sources to select. It's only by thinking that people get better at thinking. So we need to allow our students those opportunities to think and really listen for and value and understand students' insights. We need to be curious about our students' thinking and observe and listen carefully to what they're saying. And that enables us then to ask good questions. You might have noticed that when Anne ran, ran her routine early on, she asked a follow-up question, what makes you say that? Which is a really powerful addition to a lot of these thinking routines. I think an important point to make as well is the, the point that thinking is a social endeavour. And it's really important that our students are able to converse with others and play with ideas and collectively as a class create knowledge. And the teacher's role of building that social aspect within the classroom. In terms of the impact of, on students, these are some students' voices from my class. And we'll see some particular aspects here about observing situations from more angles. Obviously, that is delightful for a history teacher. Enjoying the fact that learning is interactive, not just being spoon-fed. And this is developing better understanding. And obviously, it's music to a teacher's ears to, to hear, hear or read that last quote, to become a more independent and creative learner. And I think in many respects, that encapsulates very neatly and nicely what it is we're trying to achieve with the use of thinking routines and developing a culture of thinking in our classes. So from my own perspective, by using thinking routines in my teaching, it helps my students become better thinkers. And it helps me as a teacher know how to help my students become better thinkers. I love going into class where I'm, I've 
basically approaching every class now as a research expedition into what my students are thinking. So since I've begun to engage with thinking routines, I would say that my classrooms become more focused on learning and far less, fo far less focused on just getting through the work. And that's a key principle of the cultures of thinking philosophies that let's try and emphasise the learning more and take some of that emphasis on getting through the content, covering work. After you've been using routines several times, it's really, really interesting and rewarding to hear students start to incorporate the language of the routines into their own conversations when they start making connections, when they start puzzling aloud and explaining how their thinking has changed. Now, like Christina has already mentioned, I'm very happy to answer any sorts of questions about any of this and my experiences. I'd love it if anybody listening was interested in getting in touch, Twitter, email, however you'd like. I think it's fantastic that we have these global opportunities to connect each other around the world and really push ourselves in terms of our uh, developing pedagogical approaches. And a big thank you to the Library of Congress for such a wonderful webinar. Uh, back to you, Anne. Thank you, Cameron. And thank you, Christina. So many powerful thoughts, so much to think about, and so much action to take in developing cultures of thinking in our own classrooms. Thanks to everyone. Um, I'm going to move to questions and answers. And we're going to actually start. We have a question for you. Um, we're going to also answer several of the questions that we've seen in the chat. But in the meantime, think about how visible thinking and primary sources can empower your students in your classrooms or library or your learning setting. And then let's have some questions. Kathy is going to share questions. Terrific. So we'll have the your answers coming in on how can visible thinking and primary sources empower your students to learn students learn to think and think to learn. Um, and we look forward to your responses. In the interim, I do have a question that came in while Christina was talking uh, from Mary Johnson. And let me get back to that. Um, Mary says, sounds as if you encourage multiple viewpoints, Christina. Do you train your kids to give evidence from the images? And then Karen Henderson actually chimed in and said, defending statements made by providing evidence is what I teach my students. This makes them really dig deeper when analyzing and evaluating. So I'm going to hand that over to Christina to, um, to chime in with what Karen said or to address it um, separately. Um, so I think for Mary's question, um, I do exactly what um, Cameron just said, the where do you see that or can you explain more? Sometimes I don't see exactly what they do in a picture. Um, and so it's helpful to get their perspective. Um, I also will use that opportunity to ask the class, can you add anything, or do you see that as well, or do you see something else? So it gives them the chance to participate in the discussion either by adding on or by taking it in a new direction. And they don't always agree. Um, the question that just came through as well, I'm going to answer about what they, to do when they feel uncomfortable. Um, we have had that come through with images, and we've talked about that with, um, directly with them using the see, think, feel routine. And specifically, that the, um, the think part is for them to reflect on what makes them uncomfortable about it. I also will give them a heads up if it's an image, um, the, the one of the Syrian boy, or the boy, um, sorry, the drowned boy comes to mind. Um, and I said, if any of you are uncomfortable, have you seen this? But a lot of them, I found, if they're images from the news, these are images that they're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis anyway. Um, and so giving them that heads up with the class and also talking with them about, um, about being mature and sharing their own reactions has worked for me. Um, Cameron, you might have more to add to that. Um, additionally, while the kids are talking, as we're working in a class or with the middle schoolers, when I first introduced the ideas, um, I annotate what they say and I put it in a modified outline format 
because I've spent a lot of time as a librarian teaching research um, skills, and a lot of times they are not used to seeing that process of research or that process of thinking, so they don't know what's a bigger idea or what's a smaller idea. So to go and build a graphic organizer or an outline for them as they're talking lets them see how their ideas relate to each other. So that's something that we do at the seventh and eighth grade level, but not so much in the high school. Uh, picking up on, I think it was one of Cheryl's comments as well, she used the word enculturation, which I think really fits in nicely here. What we're talking about isn't just the use of thinking routines in class, we're talking about developing a particular culture in our classrooms. And quite often the Project Zero researchers refer to Vygotsky when he said children grow into the intellectual life around them. And sometimes we need to pause and think what sort of an intellectual life we're actually modelling for our students in our classes. That classroom culture is so important. And building the culture so that, firstly, obviously, as teachers, we need to think really carefully about the resources and images that we're presenting to our students and the appropriateness of them. But building a culture where there's a comfort within the class to raise any discomfort and for it to be dealt with, perhaps not just by the teacher, but by the class as a whole. And we're not talking about covering content. We're talking about connecting content and looking for connections between lessons and between subjects and between disciplines and helping our students see that big picture. To me, I think the word enculturation really captures what we're trying to achieve. Thanks. Um, Mary, Cameron, while you were talking, Mar Mary chimed in with um, a thought on See, Think, Wonder or KWL. Um, and she mentions, I'd like to see See, Think, Wonder dislodge KWL because of the wonder part. Well, the thinking part, too. KWL seems quite entrenched. wonder if you or Christina can talk to the culture in your schools and how it supports uh, the routines that you are establishing with your students. OK, I'll jump in quickly there. We are, we've been working with these ideas for uh, three or four years now at our school. And it's really interesting, actually, to sit down beside other teachers in the staff room and to hear the same routines and the same language being used. And when our students start to notice that an English teacher and a visual arts teacher and a history teacher in back-to-back -back lessons are using similar routines and similar language, it gives them that common language to think about their thinking and to be able to express their thinking. I completely agree with you uh, in terms of using the See, Think, Wonder routine to uh, displace KWL. Uh, the See, Think, Wonder routine really effectively looks into student thinking and the idea of wondering, um, whereas KWL can be sometimes a little bit more of a focus on just on content. And the idea of that, that wondering and what, what might come next, I think, is so crucial to uh, arousing interest and curiosity in students and, and thinking about what could potentially occur in a unit or in a topic, or how their thinking could be pushed in different ways. Uh, I, I completely agree with that, that idea of displacing KWL. Perfect. Thank you, Cameron. Christine, I wonder if you could talk about the culture in your school and the visible thinking routines uh, and the strategies um, uh, and, and how that supports what the goals are in your school. Sure. Um, we are a relatively small school, so we have a lot of opportunity to get to converse with each other as teachers. And some um, a conversation that really stood out a few years ago was with um, two of the English teachers, and I just happened to be having a discussion about one of the summer reading books. And um, the students in the class said, we've never heard adults do this before. You know that we have been having classes and lessons in English where we're expecting them to discuss a book, and yet they had never seen that done. And that really changed a lot of the ways that we started doing things. Um, the same things for writing papers. We now have our sophomores read a, um, read a review in a journal, um, in an academic journal for history, and they analyze how the author came to their conclusion. Because before that, we were asking them to come up with their own ideas, but they hadn't even seen a template or, or an example of what they were trying to do. So we've tried to be a lot more open um, when I'm designing information literacy lessons or we're working with research about the goals that we want for them. Um, and also, as much as possible, when you can have that interdisciplinary or team teaching for, um, for students to see what adults 
um, are grappling with and why things are designed a certain way seems to help them get more comfortable with their own, um, with their own thoughts and their own learning process. Terrific. Thank you. We are about two minutes away from the end of this program. And I want, before I move the slide forward uh, with some uh, items, I want to make sure that you get Cameron and Christina and Anne's contact information. They have kindly put it on the screen. We'd love to get your feedback on this session. I know it wasn't long enough, and I have a feeling we're going to hear, hear about that. But please. Let us know um, your thoughts. It helps us in programming in the future. It's very short, three questions. Uh, for those who are interested, we do have a certificate available certifying one instructional hour for completing this. And by this, I also mean the recording of the event for those who are listening to this later. Um, I really want to extend a very warm thank you to Cameron Patterson for joining us first thing in the morning and Christina Palmer for joining us uh, late in the evening. Um, and thank you very much for pulling together a fabulous program for our participants. And to our participants, thank you, thank you. The, the chats that have happened here are so worthwhile. And we will have a copy of them at our office and be able to start tweeting out um, in the months, in the weeks to come about uh, the information that was shared here. So uh, again, my thanks to everyone. And um, I will end the recording very shortly. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.